Um, one of the things Africa did teach me was very simply always have a backup plan and I think that's just good advice for any risk treatment or any strategy you ever come up with. You've probably come across the expression TIA, this is Africa, um, in films like Blood Diamond. There's uh, a couple other expressions you get used to, NHA, no hurry in Africa, and, and there never is. And uh, my favourite I think is whenever something goes wrong it's always AWA, Africa wins again. And, and Africa always wins, no matter what you do, it will always find a way of being Africa and uh, things will not work out as you expect. Where we were, literally two days safari to pick up fuel supplies. Uh, we had about 50 people working at camp, mostly locals, about 45 of those. Uh, I say local, probably 30 from the immediate area and another 10 or 15 from other areas of Tanzania. Um, I'll chat a little bit about the idea of political correctness. And, and culture through this presentation and, and Africa doesn't have the concept of political correctness that we have in the West. Um, they're very blunt and uh, very tribal and very much proud of their culture. If you're uh, a Muha, you're very different from a Bantu and you're different from a, a Hutu, a Tutsi. Uh, when you check into a hotel one of the questions asked on the form is what's your tribe? Um, this is the crew, basically uh, a bit of a ragtag collection of us and uh, that's me in the middle lean in the back row leaning against the four wheel drive with a dark shirt on. Uh, great bunch of guys and girls really work well together in a team but you just have to understand everybody's got their own little way of viewing it. In that whole picture if you take away the Mazungus there's about uh, Mazungus, Mazungus by the way is European Swahili for a white person or a European. So in the rest of the crew there's about three guys here with high school educations and we would set out teaching them computers, driving skills, technicians, mechanical work. Um, this was our alfresco dining room with a view over the Rift Valley and just down there in the back of the picture about 100 kilometres from there is uh, the theoretical home of uh, Homo sapiens where mankind first evolved in the Rift Valley. One of the reasons we always had to have a backup plan was this was our main access route to get in and out for supplies for anything other than flying in and in the wet season this is pretty much what happens. Um, and no that wasn't our vehicle fortunately, that was uh, another a group of uh, primate researchers vehicle got stuck in there and they were lucky because quite often that river is well over the roof of the vehicle. In the end they got it out but um, one of the realities of this part of the world is you just can't operate quite a lot of the time and maybe that river will come up when it rains 48 hours later on a good day the roads are some of the hardest hardest conditions in the world, hardest four wheel driving. We would constantly be having to repair. We had a fleet of six vehicles which was amazingly challenging to keep on the road. That was a, a full time job for really two mechanics and a, uh, a labourer. Being said we had uh, an air trip. We had every two weeks we would have fresh supplies come in and we'd have occasional change of shifts. We'd always uh, practice our emergency response procedures at the time. Uh, there's a chap called Mongo Mongo who's one of the local guys and, uh, and he loved his role there as the fire safety officer. The vehicle in the background is the one that we rolled this season and I'll show you one that we rolled last season and that was again the reality of the roads and, and new drivers and a driver training program that, uh, well. Our backup plan for the supplies and the creek and the, the flight sometimes didn't come in or it couldn't come for weather or availability of aircraft or it was simply to have our own veggie garden and uh, we had a chap there called Johaya who knew almost no English and very little about anything else but he was a brilliant gardener. Um, you'll see the sort of stockpile that we had here in a minute. We had to fly everything in essentially um, and if they didn't have it in the supermarket which is two hours flight away um, we just didn't get it. There was no sort of note and you say oh you're just not getting cooking oil this week or you're not getting toilet paper or you're not getting toothpaste or whatever it might be so we had a, our backup plan was a veggie garden and a full pantry. The locals had their own way of getting around. This this is the equivalent of a road train in Tanzania and uh, bear in mind the tracks you can see there is one that we made which is one of the best roads. Pretty quickly once the, you left these tracks you went onto bicycle paths and uh, it's amazing what a load these guys could carry. Their backup plan for when the creek came up in the wet season was this and uh, literally a bit of a group effort for the village where the guys got together and built a hollowed out a tree and the ferryman made 300 shillings which is about 20 cents US 
per person for taking people across and that was his entire subsistence. That was one of our other vehicles. Uh, the year before we rolled another one at speed and uh, we decided that from that very quickly put in our own driver training program which reduced the wear and tear a lot on vehicles. It also showed us a couple of people who we thought could drive were actually steering wheel attendants and uh, we very quickly decided that it was best if they were not drivers after they'd done our driving test. The roads are so rutted out there that you can run the wheels like a slot car down the, the gallery there. I'll leave time at the end for questions by the way so if you'd like to type questions in we'll get to them. We talk about wear and tear, this is a, a chassis on a Land Cruiser um, basically one the same as in the last picture and when we talk about cracked chassis we're talking about seriously cracked chassis. This is the, the workshop. Well, I had a couple of containers which stored our uh, mechanical tools but essentially you uh, you worked on things where they were with what you had and the nearest the nearest mechanic who I'd say was genuinely a mechanic would, was literally um, three days drive away. So uh, the term fundi in Swahili means expert or technician but what it actually meant if you see that hammer in the front of the picture if a bloke in the village had a hammer like that then he was the local fundi and he could fix bicycles and he could fix motorcycles and he'd have a go at anything so uh, in the end we had to bring our own mechanics in just to keep our vehicles on the road. Needless to say everything out there had a price so nothing got thrown away. This was our collection of spare parts for generators, bicycles, you name it. Everything had some sort of value to us. Um, quite amazingly it had far more value even to the locals. The things we'd throw away like a a uh, plastic water bottle that might have had uh, just drinking water in it would be valuable to them to the point of scrounging through there. These two chaps worked four days in exchange for this drum. It's, we had a stockpile of spare drums there and, and we actually uh, agonised over the decision ironically of whether we should let people take diesel and Jet A1 drums away for health reasons and in the end we decided that probably the lesser of two evils was to let them use them provided we gave them soap and lessons on how to clean it out and we had made them clean it out before they took it away. Um, so in the end they could do things like boil water and keep water in the dry season and the rest but uh, it just shows something which was of almost no value to us out there was worth eight days labour for two chaps. And just to prove that none of us are infallible that's uh, me standing in front of the vehicle. You can just behind me you can see a yellow bucket which is on the actual track and I'd come through that creek and moved a little bit to the left just to avoid a 50 cent bucket and we were there for four hours uh, stuck in that mess there. I'm never going to swerve for a bucket again after this story. We, uh, we did get out in the end but what was really interesting was that um, this village was a little bit away from our camp but as soon as we were in there a group of men came over and said you know for basically the equivalent of two hundred dollars which is the equivalent of forty days wages said we'll do an hour's work and we'll dig you out um, and, and bear in mind this is where we'd provide free health care, local provisions, food to the community, employment, jobs um, uh, quite an interesting sort of perspective on the, uh, the maroon traveller in, in the end we brought one of our vehicles down from the, um, the camp we had a backup plan which is a satellite phone and called up and said please come and get us but uh, interestingly you know we broke the bull bar on this and we broke cracked a windscreen on a another vehicle and we were there being mosquito bitten till uh, about 7.30 at night in the darkness uh, just to get out of something which swerving for a 50 cent bucket uh, again the, the merit of a backup plan this little video gives you an idea of the sort of roads that are actually here we stopped here on the way, this is to our main supply town Kigoma and we'd hired, we couldn't get through it all, we'd hired 10 guys for a hundred dollars for an hour just to dig out a bicycle track and you can see here you've got to go down into it, it's hard to describe, there's, there's only about 40 feet from one side to the other from where you enter and where you leave and the actual cutting is about two inches from either side of that mirror it's um, it's just typical the roads here. Let me show you. This is another section of the same road. The government put in a, 
uh, put a bulldozer through there essentially and cut a road to Mahale National Park from the, the main town and they cleared a swath about 30 metres wide which was great but when they got to the creeks they just pushed the dirt in and we drove through it one week in about five or six hours to Kagoma and the next week it took us nine hours and this is the reason the first drop of rain completely taken it out so backup plan number one was always have a tent in your uh, back of your Land Cruiser in case you needed to stop for a while backup plan number two was always have a pocket full of cash because amazingly enough with a pocket full of cash people would come out of the woodwork and uh, you know appear from where there was no village and there was no farm and, and would come from far around to uh, to help us out and that was the backup plan for getting through some of these creek crossings this this is a interesting area you can see how heavily loaded that bicycle is you know with the drums and the coca-cola and uh, various other guys carry fresh water to the villages and so it's a regular little industry supply route and we're waiting here at the river for the ferry now I'll just let you have a good close look at the picture of the ferry if you look in the front area there you'll see the uh, the ramps have been basically broken off and they're moving blocks of wood to get the vehicles on and off um, the actual tilt down ramp the cables are broken so the ramps don't come up or down anymore there's four engines on this boat uh, two on each side front and rear and they run four propellers and only one of them works at any given time and the MV Illegala is zigzags its way across the river it's a, it's a true African experience to get across when it does run and, and quite often you'll sit on it for 40 minutes till they wait till they have enough bicycles and other passengers to take across but the uh, yeah, the interesting thing is just behind our land cruiser there on the other side is a plaque which says MV Illegala 2005 so this is a six year old ferry if you can believe it put in brand new as an aid project and uh, just without the resources or funds to maintain it just a challenging challenging process and if this isn't working we face uh, basically a two day round trip to get around just this single section of the river we uh, when we came back we brought a dog and you might have noticed him in the earlier picture and uh, we bought a dog for the guys who there in the dry season or the wet season rather when there's only four people at camp we also brought him in as a guard dog and a bit of a mascot and uh, this is Lynn doing Tunza one day all this will be yours now we called him Tunza because we found him on Lake Victoria in a place called Tunza Lodge and in Swahili Tunza means to protect now I'm not quite sure whether we're protecting him or he's protecting us but now he's a much larger dog and he's become a little bit of a focus it's it was interesting to see the change in the way um, some of the locals looked at dogs from being just a uh, hunting dog that gets underfoot to being actually a friend and uh, it, it's quite startling to see the difference in, in the west we have pets we have dogs as pets in Africa there that concept really doesn't exist in uh, most of the parts of the world this is a picture of me down on the shore of Lake Tanganyika I could show you a picture off to the right of the screen of the lake itself but you know what it just looks like you're looking at an ocean it's a massive body of water second deepest lake in the world it's 1400 meters deep it's a couple of hundred kilometers long it's um, it's an ocean a freshwater ocean you swim in it it doesn't quite reconcile because you're used to salt water in the ocean but this is just a freshwater ocean in the mountains behind there you can see the uh, Mahale National Park and the Mahale Mountains pretty much uh, nobody has been in that area you know it was first made popular by um, Livingston as he went through here and along the lake now it's a national park famous for its chimpanzees where we were exploring we were looking for minerals um, nickel platinum group minerals and, and there's quite a lot of minerals through there nothing that has yet an economic deposit but it's was it been explored since the 1950s by the Russians who did a great job and they, were, they must have been hard men because back then it was just sheer foot slogging work we were lucky enough to have trail bikes and mountain bikes you can see me there with all the armor on the uh, body armor is a really you know, the, the bikes saved us from having to cut a track which would take 10 days to get to a, perhaps a little target and an outcropping which was, wasn't worth anything in the meantime or even just to navigate to an area but we were literally eight hours flight from Nairobi for a flying doctor service so by the time you called them they flew out came out you were about 24 hours at best from a hospital so really not a lot not a room for error so there was a, a series of, of backup plans around that the other th 
process we used was mountain biking. And here we're mountain biking just behind the Mahale Mountains that I showed you in the, an earlier picture.